Hi everybody, welcome again to another lecture for uh, Intro to Public Speaking. Today I want to talk about the idea of the use of evidence. Uh, before we talked about how you find different kinds of research, talked a little bit about what the, that, you know, where those materials are. Specifically here at BSU, you can find those um, the databases that I think would be the most would be in the library would be your EBSCO database like Academic Search Premier and then another database Lexis Nexus Academic. Um, you can also use Google and other kinds of sites but I think those databases provide you the most kind of uh, authoritative ways of finding you know good research and so forth and, and then potentially um, using that research finding things that are credible and that's really one of what I want to focus on today that uh, the use of that kind of research in your, your actual presentations. So when we're talking about that, we want to talk about you know, the different kinds of ways that we are influenced by different kinds of supporting murals, the different types, and then what kinds of questions you want to ask when you're trying to look at different supporting materials. This kind of lesson can not only provide you um, good lessons for not only what you're going to do with your speeches, but also for, for evaluating evidence when you're looking at different kinds of claims from, say, anyone from different sports figures to politicians to celebrities to even your professors. Okay. So when we're talking about the idea of uh, the use of evidence, one of the things we taught we have to look at is that idea of credibility. And we've already talked about the notion of ethos. Remember, ethos is one of the three artistic proofs that is, was outlined by Aristotle over 2,500 years ago. The idea of credibility. There's a number of ways to find credibility or to, for a speaker to increase their credibility. And one of those is the use of good, solid resources. So when we're talking about, you know, when people... When research, when audiences find that they are more likely to find um, speakers are credible who use facts and different kinds of narratives that they can relate to. Things that, you know, those kinds of facts and so forth um, are, are important because they make speakers much more credible. Um, currently we have a different controversy with, you know, di what, the idea of fake news in the media. And how does that impact our judgment about what we should believe and what we should believe? I mean, the media already has a very, very low um, approval rating amongst most Americans and you know, most people around the world, but that approval rating goes down even further when we find that people are using fake news for a variety of different things. So how do you discern between those, those different items and what kinds of supporting materials should you use when you're trying to put together your own arguments? Um, one, of the, one of the different kinds of items, different examples or content that must be appropriate to the content, to the given topic, audience, or occasion, are important because you don't want to be citing things that have nothing to do with you know that particular argument. So what often happens is in an argument, you know, you'll be citing facts, and you might see someone say, "Well, your so and your brother was a cheat on his math exams," and you might be thinking, "Well, what the hell does that have to do with the argument about whether or not you are competent or or a particular debate on an issue?" And the reality is is that it doesn't. It's actually a logical fallacy. But it's amazing how many people pay attention to those different kinds of evidence and facts and so forth. And that's what we really want to talk about. How do you use what those supporting materials are and how do you use them? Um, so we have a list uh, here of different kinds of supporting materials, examples, descriptions, explanations. I'll go through each one in turn, kind of describe them. Um, you can certainly read the different kinds of slides, but maybe I can provide um, more specific examples for you. So when we're talking about the different examples, okay, so where there are three types, the short example, so it's where you support a specific point. So maybe if you're talking to a friend of yours, you might be like, you know, well, do you remember when um, Jimmy had that problem with uh, Tony and, you know, the, the ending result was, was something? Or you give like a one or two sentence explanation. But usually the people who understand that explanation have to have some kind of context. They have to be kind of in on the joke or in on the, the short example to make it work for you. Um, another way to do a short example would be to allude to something that's very popular in the media. Um, you know, if it's, if it's some kind of scandal. Well, we, you know, if you're talking about, you know, we don't want our children to be like Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. Well, that an example right there. Most people who are have been alive who are my age would know exactly what you're talking about, drawing different kinds of left lessons and so forth. That would be an example of a very short example to um, discuss what you're 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 going into. An extended example where you give a detailed and vivid. Um, a lot of times, you know, this follows the format of a story. Okay, um, so. 
when I, if you're going to give an example, you, you might hear someone um, on a testimonial, for example. We'll talk a little bit about testimonials before, but an example might be, well, let me tell you what happened to me. You know, uh, for example, I remember that I was, uh, I was down and out, and I was, you know, my life was. In other words, they give you an example of, you know, perhaps their life story or some kind of moral lesson. It's, it's vivid in detail. Um, you can see these kinds of examples all the time when you're looking at. Uh, you know, you know, large journalistic pieces or or so they don't necessarily work as well in an informative speech or persuasion speech. They can, but when we're talking about long ex extended examples, we're usually talking about you know 45 seconds to a minute. That's a long time to spend on an example when you only have four to six minutes to give um, your speech and so forth. So think about those kinds of extended examples um, that you're doing, but they can certainly work in your own writing. They can work in other presentations where maybe if you are, um, uh, you know, talking about the, the experience that your roommate had with something else, um, you know, when you're doing an essay or if you're giving a larger presentation, certainly they can be appropriate. Okay? And then a hypothetical example. Hypothetical examples, we talked a little bit about this when we were talking about introductions. Um, you know, a hypothetical opening. Imagine that you have a debilitating disease, right? Uh, I will hopefully show you a speech where a young lady actually used this when she's talking about the her speech on cryonics, which is the idea of cryonic freezing your brain and so forth, you know, in the hopes that someday medical science will be able to come up with a cure. And she starts with this kind of hypothetical example. Imagine your body ravaged by cancer and so on and so forth. But imagine there is a potential solution. And then she says, this solution is cryonics. Now, those kinds of hypothetical examples can actually work fairly well because they can provide an illustration that we can imagine uh, what's going on. So when we're talking the different kinds of examples that we want to do, is the example universal? Okay? Um, you hear all the time, when I was talking with my students about this the other day when we were talking about, uh, I'm teaching a class on American public discourse, and we're talking about American exceptionalism, and the idea is we're talking about the, the, uh, the American dream. Right? And all of us have heard stories or heard examples of people who've you know, come out of poverty and come from nothing and have made it big and so forth. Those, and those examples are often vivid in detail. Those examples are universal because they are, they are pillars of people who will, you know, who've been able to break out of you know, whatever situation they're in and make it big and be rich or be successful in their careers or whatever it is. A lot of times we want to use those kinds of examples, different things that we can relate to. Um, does the example involve people? Typically we want the more um, focused on real life human beings, um, the easier it is to relate. Does it clarify potentially an abstract topic? And is it relevant? Those are all really good questions to think about when you're looking at different examples. Okay? Um, you can also evaluate example, you can look at these different kinds of questions, but it's important to think about those, those kinds. Do the examples that you are using do they help to clarify exactly what you're saying, or do they actually detract from your arguments or from your points? Um, so think about that if you're going to use an example. And I encourage you to use examples. Hypothetical, short, are probably much more appropriate for informative, for speeches for this particular, uh, for this particular class. But if you're talking about larger kinds of arguments or writing, certainly looking, looking at extended and vivid examples would be an appropriate way to provide evidence supporting material uh, for your larger points, okay? Descriptions and explanations, okay? An explanation is, it clarifies what was previously stated. You often hear people say, well, I didn't really mean that, but let me clarify what I'm doing. Or you'll hear a reporter say, well, you know, what did you really mean by that? And so someone can provide kind of information that an audience doesn't know, or they can re-clarify uh, what's going on. When you have a description, a description is a much more kind of in-depth idea. Um, explanations kind of, you know, again, clarify what was previously stated, but descriptions describe what my experience through different kinds of senses. So if you are an athlete in high school, um, or if you're an athlete here at Bridgewater State, you might think about this idea of, um, you know, visualizing what you're going to do. Visualization is important for a lot of athletes. You visualize 
you know, the making the play if you're a football player, or scoring, or you know, if you you visualize if you're a track athlete running and so forth, how you're going to pass the baton or whatever it might be. Those kinds of descriptions in your head, we, we actually know that they work really, really well because what it does is it sets pathways in your brain so that those kinds of of um, items become you know almost second nature, and the more dis description, the more rope that you have with those things, the more you practice, the more that you're able to get into them, the more um, uh, that it helps you with, your, with uh, your, your own experiences as you move along the line, if you're going to try to perform, whatever it might be. But descriptions can be certainly useful. Um, they provide life to different kinds of details. We describe, you know, what's going on. It sounds, in many respects, it sounds like an example, but often the, this is, is where you use kind of more visualization and pictures to describe what's going on, describe that kind of sensory experience and so forth, okay? Um, it provides adequate information for what you're trying to get across, and speakers often select what they want to include. It's tailored to your audience, occasion, and topic. And certainly that is appropriate. So an example of a description that you might have is if you're going to do a speech topic on a holiday, you know, perhaps you have experienced um, a, a holiday that's unique to the Dominican Republic or something. Like they have a unique celebration when it comes to Mexico or, or, or to the Dominican Republic or Dia de los Muertos in Mexico, which is a much different way of celebrating um, Halloween that we have in the United States. If you've seen um, the latest James Bond movie, you actually have a parade. They have, people actually have parades in Mexico with regard to Halloween and they dress up in skull costumes and so forth. And that kind of visual imagery that you could provide and describe or clips can give us an idea of what it was like to be in that experience. Um, I recently took students to South Africa and, and those pictures can give an idea of um, to describe what was going on on that trip, trip was, which was amazing. I hope to take students to um, other parts of the world as well. And I encourage all of you, this is just a, an aside, that you should do a study tour here at Bridgewater State because I think it would be one of the great experiences um, of your collegiate career, if you can, uh, if you can do it. Okay? Definitions. One of my favorite things to talk about is the idea of definitions and how we define different kinds of things. So the use of language, um, you can bring, you bridge different kind of diversity, enhance an audience's understanding, but it's really, really interesting how we define different kinds of things. So for example, one of the, the debates, and again, I'm, I'm going to use a political example, one of the things that they're doing with the language of Obamacare, for example, or they're, they've been trying over the last few years is whether or not you should have health care or you should have access to health care. Well, what does the word access mean? That define that kind of definition. Access could just mean that, well, we're going to give you the opportunity to buy something, but we're not going to necessarily help you out with any kind of subsidies or anything of that nature. In that sense, they give you access to something. Like, I have access to Mercedes-Benz, but I can't afford to buy one. Um, it's amazing. That's why language is so fascinating to me. The use of definition, I think, is one of the most important things that you can take a look at. How you define specific things. Uh, for you personally, if you've gone through a relationship, if you've had the talk with your partner, what are we? How we're going to define our relationship? Are we boyfriend-girlfriend? Are we just casually dating? Is this a Tinder thing? I mean, whatever it is. That kind of defining things is really, really important. And we like to define things. We like things that are concretized often. Um, that's why titles are important in, say, a job experience. Uh, I, my favorite title for a lot, for some of you, if you when you go out to the, to the working world, would be account executive, which sounds really, really fancy, right? I'm an account executive. The account executive is actually you're really a salesperson. That's really what you are. You're you're in, in charge of various accounts at your company, and your job is to not only manage those accounts, but also to drum up more business. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with being a salesperson because it doesn't involve cold calling or anything, but I just love the different titles that we give people because it makes it sound much better than saying being a salesperson or something of that nature. Okay? So definitions are certainly important. Uh, now you can read certainly one of this. I want to kind of go through this so I, you don't have to listen to me drone on for too long. 
Um, so when a definition should be used, certainly definitions contributes to the overall goal or purpose of a presentation. Um, definitions understood easily, that used consistently, and accept the definition. I mean, again, that's why I love politics, because how we uh, describe certain things. So I'll give you a, one more example, and then I'll move on. So when d Republicans and Democrats describe certain taxes in different ways, so, for example, the Democrats will call what is called an inheritance tax, or meaning that when you die, you have to pay potential taxes on a certain amount of money. Like over $5 million, you have to pay the government, like, say, 45% of your estate. And for most of us, we would never reach that amount. I mean, I think only a very, very small percentage of Americans would ever reach that. Um, whereas Republicans often refer to those kinds of taxes as a death tax, right? You're not only being taxed in life, but you're also being taxed in death. Notice that reframing that definition of what a death tax is. Um, and that hits home for a lot of people. They're like, oh my gosh, the government is not only reaching into my pockets while I'm alive, but at the same time, they're also trying to take money away from my heirs. And so that, that, those kinds of definitions over language are extremely important because they frame how we look at you know, different aspects of the world. And we can talk more about uh, different kinds of definitions. You're probably not going to get into controversial definitions when you're doing your speeches, but it is, again, this is more about than just using this for your speeches. This is about looking at language in general and seeing how it can work and looking at different um, items when you're evaluating different presentations of your professors, of your friends, of politicians, of celebrities, of whoever might be in the public and or private eye. Okay? Analogies. Um, analogies often explains, explain something that's unfamiliar with something that's familiar, so there are different types. You have these kind of literal analogies where you compare some, two things from similar cases. Um, you know, you've got kind of more figurative where you compare things that are dissimilar and have appear to have little in common, uh, and, and so, you know, I think of, you might, it's kind of the idea of apples and oranges, right? Some people say, well, you're comparing apples and oranges. Well, not necessarily. A figurative analogy actually often does that. So if you're um, trying to compare what, um, what somebody does on a football field, like what somebody does as a dancer, right? You wouldn't think that the, you know, well, you know, uh, Tom Brady's way of passing the ball is just like Mikhail Brishnikov's performance in Swan Lake. You know, those kinds of, you know, on, on the surface, they don't really have any direct comparison. They're, they're very unfamiliar. But if you think about it, there's both beauty in the way they perform and so forth. You can actually make some kinds of connections with the, that kind of, uh, kind of idea. Or they often compare with sports with the notion of war. Is really, is really, to our sports really the idea of war, blood, and guts, and so forth? We often use those analogies to make different kinds of comparisons. Okay. Um, so, more, another, before we go back, let me just talk one, one other analogy that I love, and that's a historical analogy. Historical analogies are where we compare, say, the present time with the past. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. In 2008, when we had the economic downturn, a lot of people call that the Great Recession. As, uh, as an example, you know, that the reason it was called the Great Recession because it had direct ties with the idea of the Great Depression, especially with the, with the depths of the economic crisis that we were in. Those kinds of analogies are fascinating and so forth, um, to, to me at least, because I think those are, are often used and, and we often misuse them. We try to characterize the past with the present and so forth. So not that, again, to use historical analogies, but again, I want to explain things that go just beyond using them for your speeches, also for you to use and evaluate when language in general. Statistics, you know, you might have heard the, the, uh, the line by former British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli who argued there are lies, damn lies, and then there's statistics. And that's actually a fascinating thing because statistics can be a wonderful mode of evidence, but statistics can also be used um, in, a, in kind of in a nefarious way. My favorite example for, uh, from, this, from this last few political seasons is when politicians tell us uh, there are 94 million Americans in the country that are unemployed. Technically, uh, and technically, they're right. However, what they don't tell you is that 94 million people are people who are stay-at-home moms, are kids in college, like you guys, are people who are disabled, and people who are retired. 
So technically, yes, there are 94, but the, that's uh, how it makes it makes the, the problem of unemployment look much bigger than it really is because you wouldn't say, like my parents who are retired are certainly not at their age in their mid-70s going to come out of retirement and say, yes, I'm going to go back in the workforce. Uh, it just doesn't necessarily work. So when we're talking about mean, median, and mode, there are different ways to, to think about that. So um, and, and the mean of something can be in the average, the mode, and the median, and, and you can get into to different aspects. And, and um, those are important for your particular speeches. Uh, what's important is how you potentially use those st statistics. I mean, I encourage you to use statistics, but do it in an ethical way. You know, don't try to shade the truth toward your own end, although that's a natural kind of thing when we're trying to make arguments. But try to, do, to use statistics in an ethical way. And finally, when we're talking about the idea of testimonials, um, the opinions of others that support main points. You can see testimonials happen all the time on television. Um, one of the examples the things that I like to show uh, if we were in class, I hopefully will send you um, some just some clips, are different kinds of testimonials when it comes to television. Uh, so if you take a look at infomercials, you know, if an infomercial is trying to sell you a weight loss product, right, or they're trying to sell you a brand new way to work out, they'll have all kinds of testimonials, right? They'll have the before and after picture. I used to be 350 pounds, and now that I've taken this new weight loss product, I weigh 110. You can do it too. You know, or you hear that on the radio, uh, different people, you know, hawking different kinds of products. You know, before, I wasn't making any money. And then all I had to do was listen to Jason Edwards talk about finance, adopt his program, and now I'm making 100000 a day. Thanks, Jason. You know, those kinds of different kinds of testimonials work all the time because they're really, really powerful. Because a lot of people have been influenced by um, different products or change their lives and so forth and they want to share that experience with other people. Sometimes they're paid actors but a lot of times they are just regular people who there has been some kind of product or person or whatever that certainly has influenced their life and they want to share that and they want to say that the uh, testimonial that this person is wonderful or that this person or thing or whatever it might be um, caused them harm. Testimonials can both work in positive and negative ways. Um, you know, the, one of the final things I want you to think about when you're using evidence is one, citing sources. You must cite your sources in your speeches. You must do so. Um, if you don't, they're technically it's plagiarism. So you need to cite your orally cite your sources. Remember, now here it says include the author's name, title, source, credentials, so on and so forth. I don't necessarily believe that you have to do that. Do not pay attention to this particular part of the slide, I think all you need is source and date. Okay, Remember, if it's a regular source, which are books, magazines, um, you know, newspapers, whatever it might be, all you need to tell me is the source and the date. So according to Time Magazine, um, July 4th, 2016, or according to the book, uh, you know, uh, 1984, by Aldous Huxley or whatever, or George Orwell, or, or George Orwell was the author of 1984, sorry. Um, you could use those examples, right? You want a source and date. Um, if you want to do, for example, internet sources, remember it's just the home page and the date that you accessed it. I know that you might access a page that has a, lot, a huge URL to it, but it would be impossible for you to include all the details when you're giving your speech. So all I need is the home page and the date last access. If you do this, ladies and gentlemen, if you put together and use these different kinds of materials, um, once you find this research and put it together in, in, a, in, in a proper way, uh, your presentations will be fantastic. I look forward to seeing all of them. And hopefully also when you're taking a look at other people's presentations, you can take a look and, and see what kinds of source material they're using, but also pay attention and analyze the credibility of those sources. Take a look and criticize them. Look up what they've done. Go see where their source material is, and, and it, it not only makes you um, a better speaker, but it also makes you a better listener and critical thinker as well. I'll see you next time. Bye.